Good morning. Um, we're coming to you uh, from Riverside Park Church of God from the sanctuary. Um, I know you can't see it from home, but uh, if you were here, you would see about 10 people here. Uh, yay. Amen. <laughs> amen. I, amen. Thank I, you hope you, I hope it picks up everything because I'm going to be asking you guys a lot of questions. I'm um, right. Yeah, it's like a game show. No? All right. Come on down. Come on down. No. <laughs> but anyways, I am just so happy. I'm so happy that we can start meeting in church again. I cannot tell you guys how long I, I, I prayed for you and just wanted to see your faces. And uh, as you were walking in, it was like Jack, it was just good to see you, and, and Patty, and, and Gail, and everybody, and and I'm just so happy. I, I, I'm going to stumble over my words because I'm filled with the joy of the Lord. Um, it is so good to gather. Um, it's, it's important. I don't know if you've heard, and I'm not going to wax political, but our president said that this is essential. Amen. And I like that he said, coming to church and gathering is essential. I love that. I love it. Um, so I thought, hey, right. <laughs> so, um, again, that's not political. It's just I disagree with that. I agree. Um, amen. Um, before we get going, I just want to remind us of what this weekend is. Uh, we live in, I think, the most greatest nation in the world. I'm so thankful to be an American. And this is the weekend that we do give thanks. And we do remember all the servicemen and women that went before us and paid the ultimate price. And even those who just died of old age. Um, after they serve, this is this is the weekend that we should take pause and just remember those. So before we get into our regular prayer list, I just want to have you bow your heads and hearts with me and just remember uh, just the blessings that we have by being in this country. Heavenly Father, uh, just that, just what I said, we just want to start by thanking you for all of those who have gone before us. Uh, those who have paid the ultimate price so that we could have the freedom to come here and to worship you and to glorify you and to magnify you. So, God, we're so glad to be able to do that. Um, Heavenly Father, we also pray uh, there's a slew of us or a slew that represent this church who are active in the military right now. We think of Jason Llewellyn. Uh, George Schwemley, George Jr., I should say, Trevor Schwemley, Jordan Pollard, Jonathan, we, we just lift up all of these folks to you, and some of our neighbors, some of our family members are serving, we just pray that you would protect those people, and as they have given their lives in service, uh, we pray that you would give your protection to them, and so we think of them in this prayer as well. And then finally, Lord, in this prayer, we want to thank you for the freedom that we have in this country. And we take that prayer and we connect it to this COVID-19. I pray, Father, that you would rid the planet of this dreaded virus, that you would take it away, Father. Um, and, 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 and so we pray for our country as we reopen that you would help us to bounce back. Um, and we give you all the praise and glory for bringing us to this point. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, see? <laughs> Our numbers are growing. Oh, hey. Jackie's here. Everybody's here. Uh, amen. I am geeked, man. I am so geeked. Um, I didn't know what to do about singing. Um, hey, there's Ken. Ken Shepherd's coming in. Um, if you guys want to grab a hymnal and just, I can lead a song. Um, I think the hymnals might have been put up, so you might have to help me. Um, um, how about Lead Me to Calvary? That's always one of my favorites. I'm going to try to locate. Oh, there's one. Kenny, I'll give you one. Ken Shepard's a birthday boy from this past week. George, I'm going to turn the mic off for this so I don't sound too loud. I can mute it. Oh, you can mute it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, 189, somebody said? Do you guys know this song? I love this song. Try to follow me, and we'll just sing together. And we'll just, let's just lift our praises to God. Sing as if God was sitting. 
sitting right in this sanctuary, maybe sitting right next to you, just sing this to him. King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest Thank you. 
Anderson. Michigan, I mean, that's a local one. Michigan, Michigan State. If I've got a neighbor and, uh, and he's listening, Frank, this is for you. Um, I got a neighbor that is all Michigan State and he yeah. thinks this should just be thrown out. Yeah. Um, and of course, he's always out there with his green and his, you know, and his green hats. And uh, his sons went to Michigan State, played hockey. Um, and I always walk around my yard with my Michigan stuff. So we have a great time. Uh, with Michigan, Michigan State. This might stay there. No, I'll do that. Oh, that's okay. Okay, let me just ask this question. Um, <laughs> this is for the guys. Ladies, please don't be offended. Boxers or briefs? <laughs> Commander. What is it? Commander. Commander. Combination. Boxer briefs. 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 Boxer briefs. <laughs> tidy whiteys. We don't have tidy whiteys here. We all got an opinion on that. I'm just going to fill this one out. Don't answer this one. And don't. I don't want emails tomorrow. Or Tuesday, because tomorrow's a holiday. Republican or Democrat? I'm going to get it done. Liberal or conservative? Uh, in six months, that's going to be a big question in our country. Um, and I'm not. That's all. I'm going to move on. <laughs> Here's one. The book or the movie? Well, this one's called Knocking Day, but you know when you see a good movie or you got the book, a lot of times, and I don't get this because I'm a movie guy, the people say, oh, the book was so much better. I go, really? Really? The book? And I'm going to close with this one. This is the most controversial, and I will get emails for this. Um, this is for the guys. Anybody, I think, above the age 40 is going to get this. This is how guys talk sometimes when guys get to be with guys. Uh, a lot of times, and I've heard this for years, Ginger or Marianne? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We can do that. <laughs> Ken said, Ken just said yes. <laughs> um, come on, see if you remember here and there. Marianne. Marianne Short. You in trouble. Um, and then for, for you ladies who don't know that, you know, these, these were two pretty ladies on a, on a sitcom. I don't even know what the late 60s was. The, you'll look at you know, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so guys will get together every now and then, and we'll be talking about their roles, and we'll say, oh, Ginger. This time, one of the cable stations, now you come know, we have watch all those big ones over again. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, Patty's a vintage TV watcher. If you ever go to Patty's house, she's got these old game shows. <laughs> What's your answer, Pastor? Oh, yeah. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, no, you know, I can't do that, Steve. No, I'm I think we should vote on that and make them. Oh, yeah. Take, take a vote. Yeah. You know, we'll do it democratically, right? Yeah. Take a vote. But when you really think about it, in life, there's the. And you can think of a lot more than that, you know. Annuals or perennials for those who plant tropical flowers. There's, there's these sharp comparison contracts, and we do it all day long. We don't even know we do it. And we make choices all the time without even knowing it. The Bible, one of the genres of the Bible, believe it or not, um, from the Old Testament on to the New Testament, is the biblical writers will compare things and they'll contrast things. And one of the greatest ones to do that is the Apostle Paul. Um, if you study Paul, you find out quickly that he does a lot of comparing and contrasting. Um, I remember um, um, when I was in seminary, a lot of the papers I wrote had to be what they call position papers. So I would have to take a position for Michigan and argue it, you know, 10 to 12 pages. And so I remember my one professor said, okay, I took a class called eschatology, which just means the study of end times. In my job, and it was called a credo, I think it was 20 pages, I had to, to explain how the world was going to come to an end. And I had to give biblical examples, and I had to take a position. I'm, I'm you know, am I premillennial, you know, postmillennial, amillennial, and mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib? And I had to pick one, and I had to use the scriptures to argue why I think that's the right way, you know. Knowing that men and women way smarter than me totally 
disagree with my position. And so you had to write these position papers. Uh, and they're, they're difficult to, you know, to write because a lot of times your professor doesn't agree with you, and he's the guy grading it, you know. Um, and a lot of times you know that as you're writing this, the majority of Christianity doesn't agree with you. Um, but you got to hold true to your point. And then, in, in this class, I had to get up in front of the class and defend it. Um, so that's what Paul is doing. Imagine a, a classroom much like this, and Paul has said, we are justified by faith, and he's got to get up in the front of the room, and he's got to argue for that. That's what he's doing in the last part of chapter 5 of the book of Romans. So if you can kind of see it that way, understand it that way, I think it'll become a lot clearer to you. And once Romans 5 and 6 and 7 become clear to you, uh, you understand who you are in Christ. Uh, those of you who, who have been under my teaching for, oh, what, a year and a half now, you know that that's my job, is to let us know who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ. So this just dovetails right in there. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, I'm going to delve right into, to, well, I'm going to start at verse 12. Now look at this comparison contrast, and I'm going to use the board to kind of show it as we work through it. Paul says, therefore, just as sin, really highlight that, sin entered the world through the one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. So let's just stop right there. There's a hyphen in the NIV after what I just read, but let's just stop there. What Paul seems to be saying, or what he is saying, is sin came to the world through one man, Adam. Okay? Um, when God just created the planet, there was no sin. Uh, and, and, and then at the end, when God created everything, he created man, he created Adam, then he created Eve, then he let him go in the garden, and he told them, you'll be all know the story, eat wherever you want, but don't eat here at this tree. Well, they did. They disobeyed God. So Paul's saying, when that disobedience happened, sin entered the world. Sin just came. The sin problem came. My son and I were having a semi-heated theological debate last night, and my son said, oh yeah. Well, why would God create sin knowing it was going to be wrong? Why? So God could show how good he is? That sounds like a simple question. It's a hard question. <coughs> Paul is saying, and what Paul's going to argue for is, and wait till you hear the end of this, it'll blow your mind. But right now, Paul is just saying, sin had to come from somewhere while it came through Adam and Eve. Okay? And then Paul says, and that Sin caused death, and that was imputed to all of us. So sin came through the world, through Adam and Eve, and then they had sons and daughters and sons and daughters right on to us, right on down to the end, which is the present. And so we can say that original sin was imputed to us. Um, that is sound doctrine. You won't find... Uh, you find fringe groups, but 99.9% .9 of Christianity agrees with the doctrine of original sin. In other words, that original sin caused sin to spread to everybody. Okay? Um, and I, over the years, I've heard the argument, well, thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. And I always say, yeah, you did have done the same thing. <laughs> You know, sin was going to come through someone. It was, and this is going to be kind of hard to understand. It was God's plan of salvation for there to be this sin, this sin problem, this separation. And we're going to find that out towards the end. Verse 13, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. In other words, if you can look up here, from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, what happens in that period? Here's the question we pastors get. Well, if somebody that I knew lived right there and they died, are they going to heaven or hell? I get this a lot, actually. Because Paul 
Paul says, well, sin's not taken into account. What happens to in millions and millions of people living here? What happens to these people when they died before the law was given? Because Moses represents the law. So there's a big gap of time. Uh, and so you got to kind of go, well, gee, what happened to the people that lived in that time? Original sin was imputed to them. They were spiritually dead, Paul says, through sin. Um, but there was no law to define what sin was. Uh, I hope that makes sense because he's going to build on that. God only defined what sin was right here. He didn't define what it was in here. He, there was no definition. Not until we can say like the Ten Commandments came did we know or were we told from our God that lusting was wrong. Disobeying your parents was wrong. All the things that we knew at the giving of the law to be wrong, well, we didn't know in this time span because he hadn't given the law yet. So Paul is appealing to that time frame. And Paul's going to make argumentation from that. And he's saying the first thing that he tells us, he goes, look, um, before the law was given, sin was still in the world. So sin was active in this time. There was no law to define it. So when people ask me that question, what happened to the people that lived in that time when they died, did they go to heaven or hell? And I go, smartly, I go, I don't know. <laughs> if I was on a meter and this is hell and this is heaven, I'm leaning towards heaven because then sin wasn't taken into account yet. Okay? So we have to understand these time periods to understand what the apostle's saying wasn't an individual at that time. And, and that's, what I, that's what I'm going to go. Ken, Ken asked the question, you at home, was it, uh, how did you word it? Individual. Was an individual. And I'm going to always say, God knows the heart. Um, I think people all always knew, uh, let's pick one, incest, rape, is just wrong. You know, there's six universal mores, they call them. Uh, you know, cannibalism. You know, is wrong. You know, so there. I think everybody was born with a with a realization of right and wrong, uh, but it just wasn't defined yet. So I'm going to say I think God looked at the heart of the people in that time and saw what was in their heart, even though they didn't have a definition to follow. Were they desirous to be right? When Christ ascended, though, after his death, wasn't that to redeem? Yeah. You have to redeem the ones that have gone before. Yeah, Debbie, you're getting a little bit heavy. Oh, you're, sorry. No, no, you're 100% right. So there is redemption through the blood of Christ that, that comes back and covers this area. That's a, I'm going to have to preach that sermon. That's a good sermon. Thank you. Um, yeah, and there is redemption, and it is retroactive. It kind of is what the apostle says in another area. Let's go back to here. He says in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. <laughs> so he's going, look, here's, here's your time frame. Nevertheless, death still reigned from here to here. If you sin, you are spiritually separated from God. There was a spiritual death. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam. What was Adam's sin? What was Adam's sin? Disobeying God. Just he, 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 God gave him a command. He did the opposite. That was his sin. His sin was not eating the fruit. His sin was disobedience. God said, X, I'll do Y. But Paul says this. He said, death reigned even over him who did not sin by... Remember, he didn't break a command. As far as the law is concerned, he broke a command as far as God is concerned. He, I mean, you can kind of see the difference. There was no law that said, don't eat, you know, it wasn't written down with a bunch of other laws. God gave the command because God expected him to obey that, and he didn't, and that's when sin entered the world. But Paul is saying, death reigned anyways, even over Adam. 
And then he says in the last part of that chapter, which I love this, he kind of lets the cat out of the bag. He goes, Adam, comma, who was a pattern of the one to come. Well, who's the one to come? Jesus. Jesus. Adam was a pattern of the one to come. Well, how, how could he be a pattern? He disobeyed God and spiritual death happened. What kind of pattern is that of Christ? Well, we're going to find out. He says in verse 15, verse 15, but the gift is not like the trespass. The gift is not like the, here's that comparison, now it's contrast. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass, and trespass is just another word for sin, if the many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Ah. <laughs> God kind of set this thing in motion from the time of Adam. He set, he set this whole salvation plan in motion, and it got to Moses, and he gave Moses the law. And then it came all the way to the time of Christ, and Christ said, or Christ came, and the part of God's gospel of salvation, the plan was, now, and you've heard me say this a million times, no longer are they going to be under the burden of the law. They're going to be under grace. They're going to be under the grace. And Paul calls it a gift, and I like that. Now, now my people are going to be governed by the gift of the grace that I've given them. And so, just as Adam brought sin into the world, Christ brought life and grace into the world. And so, you can say, and what he's going to argue down the road is, the sin problem gets answered in the grace of Christ. Any questions to that point? Comments? Throw your shoe up. Okay, let's move on. Verse 16, again, so you know Paul is the great rhetorician that he is. He's going to keep reminding us. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. So here is another contract, okay? He says, let me read it again. The gift of God, which is grace, is not like the result of the one man's sin. Well, what was the result of Adam's sin? The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. Let's not skip past that word. What does condemnation mean? Anybody? Anybody? Condemnation. What does it mean to be to be under condemnation? You did it wrong. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. You're kind of, yeah, that's a way to get it. I like that. Um, you guys can't seek it. That's why you gotta come next Sunday. <laughs> you can see that. Um, <laughs> get the little plugs in there. But yeah, man, you did it wrong. Yes. And you yes. feel condemned. Have you ever felt self-condemned? No. Have you ever heaped up condemnation on yourself that God's really not heaping up? You know, uh, I love in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of Jesus Christ, the law, he set us free from the law of sin and death. And it goes on. It's a wonderful chapter. You're right, man. Condemnation is. What's wrong with you? Get it together. I did. Get it together. Come on, you're, you're better than that. Again, I'm going to read it again in verse 16. The gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. A man's sin does. When you sin, you feel, con feel condemned. When you've blown it, and when you've blown it, and you've asked God forgiveness, and you've blown it, and you've asked Him for forgiveness, and you've blown it, and you've asked Him for forgiveness, you, and then you've blown it, you just feel so condemned and so low. And God wants us to realize it's my great love for you, and it's my great grace that's over you that'll pick you up. And set your feet back on the right way. Um, Paul's going Paul's to lead us to a really important question. When I get done today, 
Paul's going to leave us with this question. Well, gee, if it's God's grace that wins over sin, I can just sin to the nines, right? And be covered by God's grace. And Paul's going to say, oh, no, you can't because God knows the heart. But that's kind of getting the cart before the horse. But the gift, and I'm reading at the last part of verse 16, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Uh, Peter, the gift, the gift of the grace of Jesus Christ brought justification. He justified us. And remember, I'd like to say it this way. It's just as if I never sinned. We've received the justification of God. We didn't deserve that. We deserved the penalty of sin. But Jesus in his grace said, I'll pay that for you. I'll pay the ticket for you. You've all heard of the barber in Owasso. You know, that's cutting hair, and they're telling him, don't cut hair, he's cutting hair. And people, from what I hear, people are telling me, people are just driving up to the store and just giving them money to pay the fines. You know, people are backing this guy. Again, I'm not taking, I'm not saying it right or wrong, I'm just saying People are paying this penalty for him. People who like what he's doing are paying the penalty. Well, that's what Jesus did for us. In a great, greater, grander scale, of course. But he paid our ticket. I should have paid it, but he paid it. That's justification. 17. For if by the trespass, see you how know, he keeps going, and he keeps, Paul keeps setting up what you could ask like what you could say, oh yeah, and Paul sets it up and he destroys it. He's, you know, it's as if he's one step ahead of us, sort of. But he says in verse 17, For if the trespass of the one man, Adam, or through that death reigns through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? There is your faith. That's what brings us here this morning. That's, that's what we stand on. Paul just explained, that's, that's our faith life right there. We, we received it. You know, God offered the gift, and we came up, and we took that gift, and we opened it up, and bang. You know, and we're made right. We don't, we don't, we don't have to deal with the reign of death. The writer of the book of Hebrews puts it this way. Those who were held in slavery all their lives by their fear of death, Christ has freed us. He freed you from your fear of death. Oh, Billy Graham says, I don't care if every man's still afraid on his deathbed. I'm sure there's probably a little bit of angst, but we in our hearts and our minds are that we've been freed from the tyranny of death. Um, I live, and we can live our lives as overcomers, who are never going to die spiritually. You know, I've, I, I, I've gotten a little arrogant with this COVID, I have to confess. You know, because I'm, I'm kind of a militant guy. <laughs> um, you know, bring it on, bring it on. This is my time to go, it's my time. And I go, gee, you kind of, kind of watch your, <laughs> your some of your words, Paul. But you know, um, I refuse to live in fear of it. I'm, I'm gonna be smart, I'm gonna do smart things, you know, to combat it, but I refuse to live in fear of it. Uh, if this is the way Christ or God takes me, Paul says to live, uh, you know, with Christ is better, it's gain. <laughs> so, um, we don't have to live in fear of death, folks. We don't have to do that. We have to live as overcomers filled with the life of Christ, filled with the justification of Jesus Christ, filled with no more condemnation. Man, what am I going to say? Good preaching. <laughs> Good preaching. <laughs> I'll just have fun. <laughs> Consequently, in verse 18, here comes Paul back and forth. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. He said that about four times now. He's just using different words. He's just using different words now. That's all he's doing. He's saying the same thing over and over to get us to understand.
understand that this is the way we need to live. Verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Amen to that, man. Just as the disobedience, uh, you know, the many were forced into this sin problem, so now also through Christ, the many will be made alive. Man. Folks, you are alive in Christ. You live a victorious life in Christ. I love Charles Stanley. Yeah. If you ever get a chance, man, check that brother out. Yeah, he, he, he comes on when we're at church, so you got to yeah. take it. Um, but he, he always makes statements like that. He, Charles Stanley wants you to know who you are in Christ. He keeps you on the path. Yeah, and, he, and he'll use kind of like... All these things that Paul uses to convince his audience, man, lift up your head. You live in victory. And he's really good about encouraging people to live the Christian life that Christ has brought us to. Okay, we're right on time. Here's where everything goes south. Check out what he wrote next. Check this one out. Man, if this don't start a debate, I, for the law was, hey, check this out, for the law was added so that the trespass might increase. What? What? For the law was added for a purpose. God gave Moses the law for a purpose. Oh, he gave it to define sin, but not so much for that. He gave the law so that sin might be more. Increase. And when I said that to my son, he goes, kind of got to do that. You know, because me and Joe, we have these open, tough debates, man. Wait a minute. You're telling me God set up this sin problem? And then he convicts us of the sin problem that he set up? You mean, to death, God gave us the law so that sin might be more? You know, and, and he likes to argue philosophically, you know, and he's good at it. And I go, well, yeah, well, why? You know, think about somebody asking you that question. Why would God make the sin increase? God doesn't like sin. Why would he make it increase? Why would he give a law so that it would increase? You guys have any thoughts? Makes us more aware of it. Ah, <laughs> To, yeah. to, make, to, make, to make it obvious to each and every person that they yeah. are not righteous. Jack, you're preaching next time. Amen. <laughs> no. Anybody else? Come on, let's add to that. He's defining what the sin is. Actually. He's defining what it is. He's telling us this is sin, this is not, this is, this is not, this is, this is not. And by doing that, the sin went from here and went straight through the ceiling. It increased. Paul says this in chapter 7, he goes, I wouldn't even know what coveting was until the law said, do not covet. And what happened when, when I found out that the law said, do not covet? At that point, as soon as I was told, don't covet, that's all I wanted to do was covet. As soon as you tell somebody, don't eat the chocolate chip cookies, those are, that's the one thing you're after, is those cookies. You know, my mom used to say that, now I'm saving those for Sunday, we're like, what? You know, and so and so's coming over. You mean you can't eat those now? We gotta look at them. Yeah. Uh, where the definition, Steve, of sin, when it when it happened, sin went through the roof. It's human nature, folks. Tell them they need to eat anything that they want, but not from that tree. And of course they were tempted, we you know the story. That was the greatest tree. That was the only tree that they wanted to eat. You can tell us, you drive anywhere you want today, Paul, but don't drive on Newburgh. I want Newburgh. <laughs> because I was told not to. Human nature wants to be rebellious. Why does it want to be rebellious? Because we're born into original sin. It's our nature. We want to rebel. <laughs> and God says, no. I'll send my son to squelch that rebellion. So Paul says, in verse 20, the law was added so that the, that the trespass might increase. But, and you know me, I love the biblical buts, but
But where sin increased, what happened? Grace increased all the more. So Steve, you're different. Where sin came in, and you know, and it was defined, and sin went through the ceiling, grace went farther than the ceiling. Grace increased all the more. If you've got a sin problem in your life, turn to the grace of Jesus Christ. And the grace of Jesus Christ will help you with that sin problem. The problem is, is there's too many Christians fighting sin problems on their own strength. And they lose. That is good preaching. That's necessary preaching. Amen. You've got a sin problem, turn to the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Paul's going to end it. He says again, let me just kind of reiterate, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, and that's why we're able to be here today, because grace is greater than greater than, you know, the, you know, than sin and the trespass. So that just as sin reigned in death, and it did, you know, starting right here, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, what Paul's saying is death doesn't have to reign anymore. It reigned in this time, it reigned, over, but now it doesn't have to reign anymore. Grace reigns. Grace is greater than sin. If you have those little less than, greater than symbols that we all learned in math, it'd be huge. You know, great. Grace is, is so much greater than sin. And what Paul, I think, and what God wants us to realize today, we don't have to live in that. We can live victoriously because of the truth of the end of chapter 5. Um, he wants us to live victoriously. If you can get to chapter 8, chapter 8 is all about how cool it is because you live in victory. This is all the stuff that you get. And it goes on and on. All the way through chapter 12, all the stuff we get. <laughs> Everybody says the book of Romans is hard. No, it's not. It's grace beating sin. <laughs> and I hope we never tire of it. And, and you know what? It sounds preachy and theological and biblical. And yeah, I, mean, I, I hope we never get tired of that. We have to remind ourselves of the grace of Christ. What a beautiful gift he gave to you and I. Amen. Man, and you know me, I ain't going to rest until I let as many people as I can know about that. Amen. And this church isn't going to rest until we let as many people as we could possibly know, know about that. Amen. You think God put this church on this corner to look good? No, I didn't know that. You're a good-looking church. We, we look good. That's not why he put us here. He put us here to be a beacon for those people that have no idea what's going on. Marching off to death. And, and they don't know all that's available to them, so they just keep marching, man. Well, I got anything to do with it, they ain't marching towards our church. And, and, and that's the kind of attitude we got to have. You know? Yeah, come on, we got to have the attitude in this church. And we're not going to let death march past our church. We got life. That's right, come on in. There's a seat for you. You know? We're going to come back. I, I, I think with all my heart, this COVID, yeah, you know, it kicked us down a little bit. Come on, Christ is so much greater than this. Christ can go like that. Yes, yes. You know, we're going to come back. Are we going to be at 80 people tomorrow? No, we're not, probably not. But this church, God, we could, why? Because God knows the heart of this church. And God needs churches like this to get that message out to those people. Feel that's why I was hired to be here. Yes, kind of like my impression of others. Any comments? Come on, give me some comments. We're so low in number we can talk. Yeah. Anybody got anything to say? Add the track. <laughs> Any? 128 would be a good closing. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't mean to close you early, but it's <laughs> Grace is greater than God. <laughs> I didn't mean to close you. No, like, is it like the same high? Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening. Let's go home with this one thought today. The grace that's in you is greater than the sin that's out there. Keep telling yourself that. Okay, what number is that? 128.
And you're leaving? Yes. <laughs> 